Have you ever wondered if some people are sent by God to you? Find out, would you, in the following video. Today, we're going to talk about something that's I don't think it's been talked a lot. Maybe I'm missing on it, on the you know, public uh, level of it. Let's go to Exodus. Exodus chapter 16, 17, verse 8 to verse 16. I know that there may movie out of this uh, character in his verses, but of course, as you know, Hollywood always twists and turns everything in the Bible. His name is Her. His name is Her. It's called Ben Her. I think it was Charlton Heston, right, who played a character, Ben Her. But these are very important verses. Have you ever noticed sometimes that certain people seem to just popped up in our lives out of nowhere? And they popped up at the right time, in the moment when we need somebody. So this is the story of a man called Her. So the backdrop of the story is the Israelites were on their way to the promised land. And then suddenly, the Amalekites came and fought them, unprovoked at that. Is that not true in our lives? Sometimes as we get closer to our promised land, there seems to be some type of Amalekites coming at us out of nowhere, unprovoked at that. The name Amalekites, very interesting right here. The name Amalekites means blood liquors, blood liquors. So right there, by the name alone, it's telling us these are the kinds of people that we need to watch for, be careful, and be watchful, right? And the Bible tells us that the Amalekites were the nemesis of the Israelites. For that reason, in verse 14, because of this unprovoked attack, God made a promise to Moses that he will utterly blot out the memory of Amalek from under the heaven. So the story goes that as they were attacked, Moses said to Joshua, choose some men, go out, and fight the Amalekites. So what happened as the story goes, right? Joshua, in this case, in this story, had become more than just an apprentice. He was taking up the leading role, so to speak. <laughs> Excuse me. In fact, according to verse 10 right here, Moses was putting Joshua in charge of this battle against the Amalekites. So three names were mentioned right here. In verse 10, Moses, Aaron, and Hur. So we know Moses was a prophet. So we know Aaron was a high priest. We know that Joshua was, so to speak, the general when it comes to the army. But who is this fellow Hur? Nothing is heard of him. Little is known of this character, right? In fact, it's mentioned uh, maybe two, three times only. Who is this character, Hur? One thing is for sure, he's not like Moses, he's not a prophet, he's not like Aaron, he's not a high priest, he's not like Joshua, a general in military, he's a nobody, he's a nobody. But notice in verse 10, Joshua did as Moses told him and fought against Amalek, and Moses, Aaron, and here he is. Her went up to the top of the hill, and then in verse 12, Aaron and her supported Moses' hand, one on one side and one on the other. Thus, Moses' hands were steady until the sunset. So the story goes that as long as Moses' hands were up in the air, they won. But the moment he put his hands down, they lost. Imagine if her did not show up in this moment. Right? Who's going to... Who's going to hold Moses' two hands? Aaron? <laughs> <laughs> this is a very simple story, but it's very profound. As I said before, have you noticed sometimes when we're going through something that is unexpected, something that is the fight of our life, God sends some people like her, a nobody, a nameless, a faceless, they are not qualified according to the story. You cannot compare him with Moses, Aaron, or Joshua. But in verse 10, it tells us right here, the moment he showed up, 
He got involved. He got busy. He didn't just sit around. He didn't just wait for order. He got busy. First ten set right there, right? He, along with Aaron and Moses, went up to the top of the hill. He volunteered. Nobody had to tell him what to do, when to do, how to do. So that's the one good uh, characteristic of people who are God sent into our lives. They volunteer without being asked. Have you noticed some people in your lives like that? They're a blessing. Is that for good or bad? <laughs> it's for good, right? Hopefully. <laughs> in this case, it's for good. Because it says right here, as long as Moses' hands were up in the air, they won. But when Moses' hands were down, they lost. So her and Aaron in this case, well, we know why Aaron would help Moses, because Aaron was his brother. That's expected. We can expect a flesh and blood to help us. But a stranger like her, right there is a revelation. Right. If a stranger would come to help us, Christians, shouldn't we Christians help one another to begin with and then do in return what the strangers do to Moses? We're living at a time right now. I believe the country is the way it is because people are really so caught up and consumed in their own individual personal lives. I, I mean, you heard me talk about this a lot, right? You know, when my youngest brother and my mom visited me years ago, this was when I was not even a Christian. My youngest brother made a very keen observation, and it's stuck in my mind ever since. He observed that in this country, as soon as a baby is born, a baby is separated from the parents as his or her own crib. And I never thought much about what he said until I began to study God's word and I received the revelation. If a baby, from the moment a baby is born, is separated from the parents, given his or her own crib, that baby is being taught indirectly to be self-sufficient, to be self-dependent. This is not why we as a people become a people who are individualistic. And then when the opportunities come for us to fulfill the role of a her, like her, right? <laughs> we have a hard time. Well, I guess my question would be, I mean, this was to sustain Moses, but I mean, what about those small things like, uh, I don't know, some lady needing your gross, not even needing, but just walking up and helping her put her groceries in the, the car or something like that is it is that as significant as what josh or what uh aaron and her did absolutely absolutely in this case i believe moses spotlighted this right beyond just to tell us uh a part of the history of the jews so to speak on their way to the promised land having been uh put in this predicament by the amalekites their nemesis at that uh, beyond the literal interpretation of the story, the application and the relevance of it is look out for the people that got put into our path like her. And then if you want to take this up as a challenge, will you be willing to be a her when God gives you the opportunity? Right? I don't know, the other day when you asked if, uh, as we drive by, somebody sitting on the road, you know? There you go. Right? There you go. I mean, how many times? How many times, if we're honest with ourselves, God gives us opportunities to be her, and then we don't. We don't seize the moment, you know? This guy came out of nowhere. Nothing in the prior text or the succeeding text tells us about this character named her. He just popped up out of nowhere. And when the situation calls for him to act, he did without being asked at that, right? So number one, he was ready to be involved. 
he volunteered without being asked. And if you look at number first number 12, right? Without him, as I said before, Moses' hands would have not been up in the air all to that time. Notice it says in verse 12, thus his hands were steady until the sun set. So if we assume, back to verse 9, tomorrow I will station myself on the top of the hill with the staff of God in my hand. If we assume that they went up on the hill 6 o'clock in the morning, and according to verse 12, until the sun set. Imagine holding somebody's arms for how many hours? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, <laughs> it sounds very simple, right? 12 straight hours. You got to go pee. What are you going to do? <laughs> you got to do number two. What are you going to do? <laughs> Hold it. Yeah. See, we're never given much thought to it, right? But when we really process it, he, he cannot afford to take his arms off Moses' arms because it sets right here. As long as his hands are up, they won. But when his hands were down, they lost. Okay? So that's how invaluable his service was. It's also the point of once you step into it, you gotta, you gotta stay until it's completed. That's that's a chore right there. What did I just do? That's a great observation. This is why, right? You and I, as Christians, once we become a Christian, it's not how we start; it's how we end. It's not how gang ho we start a Christian life and walk. It's whether or not we can maintain that passion. We can maintain that seal. We can maintain, in this case, his commitment to hold Moses' arm. Something very simple. Yeah, but, <laughs> but, but consuming, I just got to think about it. I just, you know, you know, it's like a, somebody moving a wheelbarrow full of stone. Can I give you a hand with that? Yeah, but I got 150 more to go after this. Okay. <laughs> there you go. It's 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 very uh, feasible to do a good act once in a blue moon, but to do it consistently, committedly, obediently, and faithfully. I think this is implied in this statement until the sun set. That's big. Right? I mean, you take that into our home in the context of a husband and wife. Are we holding up our wife's arms when she needs us to do that, or vice versa? Are we holding up our family when we have to, when we need to, vice versa? And then you translate that into the ministry. You translate that into the community. There is an enemy. This story tells us there is an enemy. And, and, and as much as we don't like to admit it, receive it, the Amalekites, the fact that the names Amalekites means blood liquors. What that means is the enemy is going to cause you to bleed. The more you bleed, the more they like it. That's scary, but true. So you have a choice. You give up, taken captive, which you're going to be slaughtered anyway, or you put up a fight. But if you do put up a fight, it requires teamwork. Somebody has to be Moses. Somebody has to be Joshua. Somebody has to be Aaron. Somebody has to be her. This story challenges you and I. If you were in this predicament, which character would you choose? So can I bring it home to you even more? Sure. I, I'm just getting questioned now. So when we were, at, we were down in Florida, we stopped at Ashley and Thomas, and they're big watching Netflix stuff and they started watching this Netflix series then that they told Mimi to watch now she's uh, enthralled in and I believe it's called evil but it's about a, a Catholic somebody who wants to be a priest is is dealing with Satan and Satanism stuff and they're highlighting a lot of what Satanism does to these people through, through manipulation and stuff and and it bothers me that these guys are so wrapped up in that and they believe because of this because they're being exposed to this, that they're getting some sort of um, 
religious story out of it, like stuff. And I, and I said to my wife last night, this is nothing but false prophecies. And I, even though, she, I mean, I can, I can challenge her not to watch. I can't force her not to watch it, but she's so wrapped up because they're run. And, but it, it bothers me that, that they, they can't open the Bible, but they'll look at these stupid shows that'll, that'll give you the other side of the story and make you believe that you're getting something. Oh, now I'm, I'm a little scriptural because now I can see Satan's little plans out there, but I don't see it as that. And it, and I see it as a false prophecy, and I just, and the, and the ch only to the challenge them makes them think, oh, there's Stephen going on his conspiracy theory is again, you know. But they know where he, at least Mimi knows where I feel, but it doesn't stop her. So where do I? And so that volunteer, that person needs their arm held up, and, I, and they're not allowing me to do it. I mean, without me forcing, you know, overtaking them physically. Great question. Great question, Stephen. That's very relevant, very personal, very pertinent. It can happen to anyone. There's of us. a lot of scary stuff on television that you know. Um, if it, if it, I don't know if it, if it all just seems like it's full of lies, or if it's like something like what Bill talked about, where he said that even though it was kind of an evil, it got to show him how, you know. It seemed like Satan worked in people's lives kind of thing. So he was kind of into it. But, you know, if it just seems like a bunch of lies, then I don't know what you can do about it because it's hard to tell people what to do. So now all you can do is, I guess, speak your peace and live <laughs> by example, right? <laughs> what else are you going to do, you know? And, it's, you know it. and here's the thing. In the few minutes that I did watch it, it shows me all stuff that potentially I could believe that Satan's doing out there. But the fact, well, there's two facts and, and I'll be honest with you. The fact that it's, they keep reverting back to the Catholic religion that this guy's working through. He wants to be a priest, but he has to deal with all these things. But the reality of what these people are going through, well, I can see that, you know, and, and, and the whole demon thing, I'm so challenged on demons because I don't know if they're actually, a physical being attack or is it something that I let a seed into my spirit, uh, lust, pornography, whatever, and, and never let it die, you know? So I don't know what the demons really are. And I'm sure there's Satan's got them out there, but I really worry about my own, my own faults and, and failings, you know, the lusts, the everything, those demons that I, I can actually put my finger on. Yeah, that's a good situation to talk about, right? Remember, I said before, when it comes to Satan and demons, right? We, we should not be putting too much time, energy, and effort into trying to, to know more about them. We should be spending the equal amount of time, energy, and effort to know Jesus. Because the more time you give to Satan and demons, the more you're going to get caught up and consumed into it. So it requires, on your part right there, right? Patience, love, discernment, understanding to help them to see. The same amount of time you're spending on watching these kinds of movies, trying to be convinced of the existence of Satan and demons and what Satan and demons to other people, if you would spend the same amount of time learning more about Jesus Christ, you'll be better off. That's number one. Number two, they've been deceived by watching those movies, so to speak, right? They've been deceived into fighting the wrong kind of battles. Well, and that's that's where I, my next point was going to go. They're, they're being manipulated that they can really stand up. And I just think of uh, Matthew before he was Matthew in the Bible that he tried to challenge Satan and he ran around, ended up running around naked. He, you know, these people think they got this false sense of security now because they're aware. But I got news for you. I wouldn't even want to touch that. It's like going into a riot kind of thing for me. Yeah. I mean, even in this story right here, Joshua is the one that's fighting. Not even Moses, his teacher, so to speak. And all that Aaron and her did was holding up Moses' hand. So in this situation, it could be very uh, 
possible that the people that are watching those kinds of movies have been deceived by those movies to think and believe that they're fighting for Jesus Christ. When in reality, no, they are not. And all that Jesus is asking them is watch, watch from a distance what's going on. And then I get involved, not get caught up. That's a good, excellent, uh, real life situation to, to, to talk about, see, when it comes to spiritual warfare. What do you do as a husband? Yeah, I, without without being a thug, I can yes. just, I separate, yes. I separate myself from that room. Yes, that's a very challenging predicament. Right? If you say it in the wrong way at the wrong time, it's going to become a, a, a tool for the devil to cause more strife and division and quarrel and argument between you and your wife. That's and, about. And here's the sad thing, I guess, when we were down at Thomas and Ashley's over the weekend for maybe what was maybe they could afford two hours to stay with us just because she's close and tired and and they're 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 set. It just broke my heart because I long to talk to her about Jesus. And I know her spirit longs to hear what I might have to say about Jesus. But then when she changes the course of, I don't, what can I say about this? What am I going to tell you how to live your life kind of thing? I just, I feel like I missed the opportunity to speak, you know? And then yeah. what that's the way it was. Mimi and Thomas, they all spoke about the, how they enjoyed this and how, what they're getting out of it. And, and it's just a filler for me. It's just, it's a, a waste of time filler. And then, and it's sad because the next time I see Ashley now is most likely when she's going to deliver. And I really well, want to pray over it. That's exactly what Paul is talking about, right? He said, in the end time, people will only want to hear what tickled their ears. So something like a movie like what they're watching tickled their ears, got their attention. And if they're not strong in faith, if they're not strong in faith, imagine the outcome of that. So this guy right here was involved without being asked, volunteering. This guy was invisible. Nobody noticed. Nobody knew until he showed up at the right time for the right reason. He is invaluable when it comes to his service. But the most important of all, what he's doing right here, it may not look like he's getting anything out of it, but if we go to Exodus, Exodus chapter 31, verse 2, Exodus chapter 31, verse 2, give us a revelation. Gives us a revelation about this guy, her. And this is very, very important. This is 30, revelation. 31, verse 2, right? Yeah. See, I have called the name of Bezal, Bezalel, the son of Uri, the son of her, of the tribe of Judah. <laughs> See? What is the context in chapter 31? Exodus 31. What is the context? What is the main story? Big picture. The skilled craftsman. God is getting ready to instruct Moses to build the tabernacle, right? And guess who God chose to be the architect? to be in charge, this guy named Bezalel. And according to verse yeah. two, what was his relationship to her? The grandson. The grandson. So you tie this verse two of Exodus 31 to this verses in Exodus 17. He may be a nobody, nameless, faceless, but his service on this particular day took grab a hold of God's attention to where two generations later, one of his grandchildren named Bezalel was handpicked by God himself to be the architect to build the tabernacle. Mm. That's worth a lot of meditation, right? Tell me in the Bible, where it tells you and I what to become of the descendants of Joshua, what to become of the descendants of Moses, what to become of the descendants of Aaron. <laughs> but this one individual, a nobody, nameless, faceless, 
one day of service, 12 hours, merited him to have his grandchildren, one of them, to build the moving tabernacle in which and through which the presence of God follow the people. That's powerful, isn't it? Sure is. There's yeah. the only hope. Yeah. See, whatever service we render unto God, it may be at the time when we're giving that service, doing that service, seem insignificant, seem trivial, seem to be fruitless, put it that way. But God is a God who is not bound by time. He already knew what he was going to do when he put you in a path like he did her. And hers obedience, faithfulness, commitment, devotion, voluntary at that. Nobody asked him. God rewarded him two generations later. You know, ministry is a spiritual work. If you don't have thick skin, you shouldn't be in ministry because people are going to, you know, attack you, assault you verbally or what have you. Look at her right here. He wasn't nobody. Can you imagine the struggle within him when he showed up and held Moses' arm standing next to the high priest, Aaron? Imagine what went through his head and his heart. Wow, I'm standing next to the high priest. I'm a nobody. And I'm holding the arm of the prophet, the man of God, who saw God, who spent two times, 40 days up on the mountain mm -hmm. with God. So John? the Amalekites, yeah, so the Amalekites were <clears throat> wiped out to where they had no descendants that exist anymore, like say now. The last uh, descendant, if you want to put it that way, of these uh, Amalekites, if you go to Esther, Esther chapter 9, verse 5 to 10. Esther chapter 9, verse 5 to 10. That's the last mention of a descendant of the Amalekites. And guess who this descendant was in that verses? Chapter 9. Verse 5 to 10. We all are familiar with the story of Esther, right? But little do we know. Everything in the Bible is connected. There it is. Haman. The name Haman and his sons eventually were executed on the same gallows that he built to execute the Jews. Mordecai, right? Exterminate the Jews. Notice right there. Haman was an Agagite. Agagite a descendant of the Amalekite king Agag. Agag. Agag, as a king, was an Amalekite. Right there, the last known historical record of descendants of the Amalekite. So when God says, I'll wipe you out, he will wipe you out. <laughs> yeah, I just thought it was kind of funny, but I did read it thoroughly, and I, and I know it said, then the Lord said to Moses, write this in a book as a memorial and recite it to Joshua that I will utterly wipe out the memory of Alamac from under heaven. And, uh, but I thought it's funny. They wanted to write down, uh, write it down as a memorial, but yet wipe out the name. <laughs> you know what I mean? Instead Ironic. of. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Ironic. Right. Usually our Western mindset interpret the word memorial in a different way. What do you yeah. want to remember somebody who you're going to wipe out? Right. <laughs> in this case, this is a promise. When God says right here, write this in the book as a memorial. The idea is that so that the succeeding generations of the Jews, they have something to look back and to remind themselves of the mighty arm outstretched arm of God, right? And notice in verse 15, Moses built an altar and named it Jehovah Nitzi. The Lord is my banner. And that's very important right there. When you face an enemy like the Amalekites, God will send into your path a person like her. And when all is said and done and over with, you need to build an altar. 
you need to memorialize that place. In this case, Moses not only did build an altar, but named the place Jehovah Nissi, the Lord as my banner of victory. And notice right here, Moses did this before God even fulfilled this promise. Well, if they didn't write it down and we were reading it now, we wouldn't know about the lesson that's supposed to be learned here anyway. So, so this story is like a memorial to you and I from Moses, despite the fact we're not even Jews, right? To, inst to, to stimulate in us faith in God, hope in God, to challenge us to believe that Despite the fact we might be facing an Amalekite or Amalekites as a group of people, God says, I'm going to send into your path some hers. And we need to be raising up the banner of victory. God's banner of victory. The idea of building an altar right here is a consecration, right? We consecrate ourselves. To God's promise. We believe that he will do it. We don't deviate from it. Right? Notice what Moses says at the end of this story. Verse 16. And Moses said, Yahweh has sworn. Yahweh will have war against Amalek. From generation to generation. Until the book of Esther. Where the last known descendants of Amalek. They eventually, having dug a pit for Mordecai, they fall into the pit themselves. Powerful promise. But notice right here, nothing in verse 14, when God said to Moses, right? When Yahweh said to Moses, write this in the book as a memorial. Nothing in this says God told Moses he's going to war against the Amalek from generation to generation. Right there is the evidence of Moses being a prophet. That piece of information in verse 16, that God, Yahweh, will war against Amalek from generation to generation. He must have received that in a private manner. Uh, right? Yeah. So this story right here teaches us a few things about her. Her is a type of people that are God sent in our paths, in our lives. And the number one decision we must make is to discern, to discern who is God sent in our path, in our life. And once we discern correctly, we shouldn't be standing in God's way. Imagine if Moses or Joshua or Aaron had told her, who are you? Nobody called you. We didn't invite you. Get out of the way. We have our enemy to face. We have a battle to fight, right? Well, I mean, I, I almost, you know, I'm probably putting into this, but I almost think Aaron had to be blessed to have a guy like her come in there, you know. Hey, let me give you a hand, Aaron. <laughs> yeah. yeah, circumstantially speaking, Aaron was grateful for her, right? But nothing in this text tells us that Moses, Aaron, or Joshua had, a, had an issue with her. They welcomed him. So when God sent people into our path, a person like her, we need to welcome them. Don't refuse and reject them. And let this person do what God sent them to do. In this case, something as simple as holding Moses' arm. You know, did you notice sometimes that the people got sent into our path, the things that God are uh, 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 charging them to do, so to speak, may seem insignificant to you and I. But there's in there one assignment from God to them, in this case, from God to her. There could be a make or a break, a battle at that in this situation, in this narrative. So who would you rather be in a situation like this? Joshua, Moses, Aaron, or her? Any one of them. 
<laughs> I, you know, but we are called to be hers now, though. I think, you know, I think, yes. I think because of where we are in Christ, I think, you know, I think the opportunities for us to be the hers come a we, little bit more. You are spot on, especially in light of what our nation is going through. You might not be a Joshua. You might not be a Moses. You might not be an Aaron. You might not be a military general like Joshua. You might not be a prophet like Moses. You might not be a pope, a bishop, and a cardinal, a priest, a pastor. But every one of us can be a her. You know what the name her means? Splendor. Splendor. Look at that. It is in what you do that God has assigned you to do. It is in that good deed that you do that God has assigned you to do that you become a splendor to God. And when you do that, what God assigned you to do, that has become a splendor to God. God for sure will bless your succeeding generations. May not be your children, maybe your grandchildren, as in the case of her, to be tasked to be an with architect the, with the architecture of the tabernacle. One service, one call, one commitment. God is a rewarder. The book of Hebrew tells us he is a rewarder of those who seek him diligently, right? One way to seek God diligently is to seek a situation where we can be a her, like her right here, to Moses, to Joshua. Moses can tell Joshua where to go, what to do, when to do, how to fight. But without her holding his arms, they would have lost this battle. We wouldn't be talking about this right now. Do, do, we, do we talk more any about uh, hers first son, Yuri, or any more about the grandson of Bezalel other than what's in uh, chapter 31? That's about it. That's about it. As a matter of fact, you know, when you talk about his grandson, right? The name Besalel, the name Besalel means in the shadow of El, in the shadow of God, in the shadow of El, in the shadow of God. So the idea is he must have heard this heroic act of his grandfather passed down to him by his parents. And because of that, Think about this. Nothing, nothing in the Bible tells us about Bezalel. Just like not much in the Bible tells us about her. But as he was growing up, Bezalel must have heard from his parents the stories about his grandfather, her. How when the Jews were fighting the Amalekites, the parents were telling him, your grandfather, her, held the arm of the prophet, Moshe. For 12 hours and because of that we won because of that we made it into the promised land because of that you are who you are today you see talking about legacy talking about heritage how many of us make the effort to seek and to search our christian legacy and heritage and then to pass it down to our children and grandchildren whether orally or practically at that by exemplifying their legacy and heritage and how to live it out. I'll bemoan the fact. Many Christian families, the parents are very blessed by God, but they don't see the necessity and the importance of passing down those Christian faiths and values, beliefs and practices. Well, if, if I can be honest with you, I, I, you know, I don't, I don't rate Thomas and Ashley up as as evil because of what they're doing. They're actually extraordinary. You know, we always said Thomas had a young, uh, an old man spirit about him. You know, he never was a, a punk, so to see. And Ashley's the kind of the same way. But then in this situation where I'm watching them being taken in by the Hollywood aspect, of, my only hope is to really have a relationship with the granddaughter. Uh, I mean, I'm like, I'm looking forward to it to maybe save, you know, in a, in a more intense you know, I don't, I don't, I don't look at it like I'm doing a favor for God and, and he's going to um, bless the generations to come. I believe that's going to happen no matter what. 
but I just long for that release, that spiritual relationship I've never had with anybody. Really, I really, not my wife, not my children, not with this. We've all touched on the spiritualness of it, but I'd, I'd love to have the relationship with a, a family member that I have with you and Sean, that we can talk about that God. And I, I look forward to it. You know, in my mind, I'm feebly saying, I can't wait to hopefully hold that girl's hand and walk down the street and talk about Jesus. You know, and that's my longing. That's what my spirit's wishing. And then I see stuff like that, and I just wonder. And you know, I just pray that the outcome will be eventually be that. And I guess after reading this, it gives me more hope that that potential is coming because of my loy. I believe my loyalty to the Father. I hope. You, without you realizing it, you may be in this predicament to be a her, to be a her. I hope so, brother. I to Ashley and Thomas. Place. Yeah, to be a her to Ashley and Thomas, who already are caught up and consumed in the world, so to speak. Yeah, I know. I mean, I know. Yeah. And here's the thing, Ashley, Ashley looks for that relationship with me. I don't know how she, I don't know if she's comfortable enough to get to it, because, you know, she after she explained how the, 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 the show she went and got her Bible and said, see, I still read the Bible. And look, see, I still write in it, too. And I thought that was good. There's still hope. I mean. <laughs> well, you just, have to, you just have to kind of continue conversationally talking to God about the situation. And today, maybe today, maybe the story is for you, Stephen. You know, you're saying to God, I want to be a her for my granddaughter. Well, I want to be a her without being, without having it, without yeah. it too, you know. I really want to be that guy. And he hurt you, you know, God hurt your desire. Right? Everybody needs a her, myself included. Right? <clears throat> but beyond just desiring for God to send hers into our path. I think sometimes God is challenging us to be a her for others. And in light of the fact that God bless her grandson, Bezalel, to be the architect of the tabernacle, I think it behooves us to ask ourselves this question. Is it possible if we would say yes to God to be a her to others, that he's going to merit a succeeding generation, children or grandchildren, to be the architect of his tabernacle. And that, and that, that even challenges me, is it the architect of the, at the tabernacle or the priest of their family? Is it one and the same? Yes, yes. Whether well, tabernacle or priest to the family. <clears throat> it's a very precious, it's a very privileged task, assignment, calling for ministry. Like I said before, you know, Hollywood has made this story, this narrative, put it that way, and turn it into something that is not intended by Moses to be. The whole idea is you and I are going to face an Amalekite. That's a given. Everybody that's on their way to the promised land will have to fight a, a battle, and the enemy will be an Amalekite. And when that happens, Notice right here, God is going to send a Moses, a prophet. God is going to send an Aaron, a priest, a pastor, a man of God. God is going to send a Joshua, a military general. God is going to send a nobody, her. It is this nobody that you have to be discerning, that you don't miss out. Because he looked different compared to Moses. Because he looked different compared to Aaron. Because he looked different compared to Joshua. See, it's going to require discernment for you that you don't reject and refuse the hers that God is sending into your path. And once you made it into your promised land, so to speak, or along the way, God is going to put you in a predicament like he did her. You're going to be the her to somebody else. Focus on the reward that God gave to her and his grandson to be an architect 
of the moving tabernacle through which God's presence abided with his people. I hope the preceding video has been a revelation to you of the people that are sent by God into your path. And I pray that you yourself will be one of those that God sends in the path of others. Thank you for watching. See you in the next episode. And God bless.